Thank you. You're welcome to uh, get your coffee cup refilled in the back. Uh, it, is, uh, it is an early morning event in Washington. We recognize that fact. Uh, but I'm very pleased to, uh, to welcome a panel of experts uh, to continue the discussion. Uh, first, I, I thought uh, Congressman Polis's remarks were, were quite uh, in, enlightening and, uh, and, uh, and provocative. And I, we hope to continue that uh, to, with, with the panel. We have four panelists. I will introduce them uh, now. Uh, I'll turn to each of them for a five minute uh, of opening remarks. We'll have it, then we'll continue on with a discussion uh, among the panelists and with the, with the audience. Jake Colvin is the uh, Vice President of the National Foreign Trade Council. The National Foreign Trade Council is a large uh, international, large American organization, almost 100 years old, with roughly 350 member companies that has always had its as a core mission uh, uh, advancing the interests of, of globally engaged American companies. Uh, Jake is uh, a key player on this panel because he was uh, the leader in negotiating a, uh, a, a statement on business priorities for the digital economy that is widely used. It was done in 2011, and uh, it, the document is impressive in its depth and breadth of content, but also the degree to which it reflects a broad industry consensus on a very fast-moving issue. Um, having in, in my career, career previous to uh, CSIS, I looked at a lot of coalition letters, and I can't remember another one that had both Citibank and GoDaddy.com as signatories. <laughs> Somehow Jake managed that, and he's going to tell us how he did it. Uh, uh, next, uh, uh, Kenneth Smith Ramos. Uh, Kenneth Smith is uh, the uh, head of the trade office, NAFTA office for the Embassy of Mexico. A long career in the Mexican government, uh, long, much, uh, much longer than it appears from his hairline. Uh, Kenneth was uh, part of the negotiating team on the NAFTA and uh, really started, started there and has worked with the Mexican government ever since. He now represents um, the uh, Mexican uh, Ministry of Commerce in Washington, D.C., and is a, is a, uh, a key voice on uh, Mexican interests, commercial interests in the United States. But what we hope he covers as a panelist is how the uh, partner economies in TPP, which are, have some similarities but are often quite diverse, uh, are responding to the U.S. initiatives and other initiatives on the, in this uh, space in the digital economy. Next to Kenneth uh, is uh, Gary Horlick. Gary Horlick is, uh, is a, uh, uh, one of the top trade lawyers uh, based in Washington, but really worldwide. He's had a very long pro productive career with, with a wide range of clients as a, as a practicing trade lawyer. But he also has a very unique career in Washington in that he was both executive and legislative branch. He was, he was the uh, one time the International Trade Council for the Senate Finance Committee and also the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Import Administration. So he's seen this in Washington for a long time. I invited Gary on this panel because Gary has been working digital issues since the days of dial-up. And he is uh, uniquely uh, uh, positioned to discuss this disconnect that has developed between a very fast-moving, disruptive technology and relatively stable and uh, somewhat inflexible trade rules. Uh, finally, uh, Johanna Shelton is uh, the uh, Senior Counsel uh, for Law and Public Affairs, or Public Policy and Government Relations for Google. And uh, Google has been in the forefront of these issues. Johanna has uh, an as, as careers in Google go, she has an extensive one. She's been with the company since 2007, which is back. Not many Google employees can probably say that, <laughs> given the, 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 the rate of growth of, of that particular company. But Johanna had a career in uh, Washington, uh, mostly on the, in the U.S. House Committee on Energy and Commerce, uh, but also uh, uh, working with the Federal Communications Commission and uh, with private, private, in private practice. So we have a very broad, diverse group of panelists to talk about this, this fast evolving issue. I'd like to start by turning it over to Jake. Well, thank you, Scott. And um, you know, when Scott was at uh, Procter & Gamble, he was the chair of our WTO committee. And uh, it was always um, one of the top people that I turned to to, be, uh, to think thoughtfully about issues. And so I'm glad you've, you've brought that thoughtful approach to CSIS and to the digital economy. Um, I, TPP is exciting for us because it's the first time that uh, we're looking at a trade agreement through the lens of how it can improve uh, the digital econ the global digital economy. And this is important to all of our member companies uh, because of the importance of in digital information to how they do business. Um, so as we started thinking about this, one of the things that Scott mentioned that we did was in 2011, we convened a group of companies and associations 
uh, to discuss a couple of things. The economic importance of information, digital information flows, problems that companies are facing, uh, and what I would sort of characterize as uh, digital protectionism that's creeping around the world, uh, and the potential to improve uh, the global trading framework to foster open markets for information uh, and digital technologies. And so as, as Scott alluded to, we came up with a six-page set of principles. And the basic idea behind those principles was to apply uh, trade disciplines like transparency, like non-discrimination uh, to information uh, and internet-based services. And so among other things, what it does is uh, we call for the US government to seek commitments on a range of issues, uh, including sort of presuming the flow of information across borders, uh, to prohibit local infrastructure, server, and investment requirements, uh, and to ensure th uh, that things like uh, security and privacy rules aren't used as a, as a disguised barrier to international trade. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really proud of the consensus that we were able to come up with. We had 10 associations sign on in addition to NFTC. It was everyone from the Chamber of Commerce to CCIA. Uh, and 11 companies also asso associated themselves with um, the principles, including uh, Citi, Google, Microsoft, and Visa. And I think it has helped inform um, some of the commitments that you see being proposed in the TPP. I guess I'd make maybe just a couple, three observations uh, as I've had time to reflect on what we did in, uh, with those principles. Uh, the first is as you look at the negotiations, I think it's, it's clear that it's challenging to translate broad principles into specific commitments uh, in the TPP. Uh, TPP provides the first lab really to work on some of these digital trade issues. Uh, it's, I think, as cutting edge as trade policy gets, and so uh, you wouldn't be surprised that there's a heightened sense of wanting to get it right uh, and thinking and a need to think through important issues uh, like privacy. Uh, the second is, is that um, thinking about the industries that drove the process, they were largely US ICT, internet, uh, and financial services companies. You know, for me, they turn out to be the tip of the spear uh, for companies that care about these issues. Uh, they were most active, I think, initially in forming policy solutions but what I see is a growing appreciation among our broader membership for the importance of digital trade policies. Chevron is digitizing their oil fields. GE is monitoring smart power plants uh, from across borders. Procter & Gamble uses uh, the internet websites, Twitter, Facebook, to connect with customers around the world. Uh, but I guess, and, and, and Congressman Polis mentioned this, I think the real promise is that startups and small businesses can participate effectively in the global marketplace for the first time in history on a broad scale. Uh, and so I'll give you just one example that's relevant to the TPP. Uh, the shirt that I'm wearing today is from a company called Proper Cloth. Uh, they're an online custom shirt manufacturer uh, based in New York City. They've got a showroom in Soho. And so you go online and you design a shirt, you put in your measurements, uh, and then two weeks later you get a shirt that's shipped from their uh, facility in Malaysia. They've got five employees in New York, they support manufacturing in Malaysia, and they export to more than 20 countries. So this niche didn't exist 10 years ago. And the reason why it exists today is not just because these guys can, can hang a digital shingle on the web, but because of improved logistics services, payment and shipping services, uh, and the online communities that have developed around Facebook, Twitter, blogs, message boards, that help to validate the company uh, and make me uh, sort of see that their product is worth checking out. Uh, and so maybe just to close, the final ref reflection is that the principles that we developed were specific to fostering global flows of information and digital technologies, and that's really only part of the solution here. Um, fostering an open and secure global digital marketplace uh, requires a whole suite of policies, not just on information, but also on logistics and shipping services, payment, retail, customs, mobility policies, uh, intellectual property rights frameworks, uh, appropriate intermediary liability protections. and so. You know, as a broader point, getting the entire TPP right is, is important for a number of reasons uh, unrelated to the digital economy, but certainly because of the digital economy. So thank you. Thank you very much, Scott, for the invitation to participate in the CSIS event uh, and have the opportunity to share uh, with you and the participants a little bit of the viewpoints on uh, from Mexico when it comes to the issue of the negotiations and the TPP, in particular on the digital economy. And I would just like to frame the discussion very quickly on uh, the importance that the TPP has for Mexico. And this has to be put in the, in the context of the importance that the trade has for Mexico. 70% of our GDP depends on international trade. Uh, we have trade agreements with uh, 42 countries. And we are a country that for the last 25 years has engaged in an active 
program of trade liberalization. And nowadays, uh, this type of trade liberalization goes beyond the, the classical just reduction of tariffs. We have to look at the disciplines that exist in international trade rules and how we can improve them, strengthen them, and in a way modernize them to reflect the realities of how the economy has changed, in particular from the time where we negotiated um, the NAFTA agreement. So that's where TPP and the digital economy discussions are very important. That's one element where we see TPP moving the needle ahead of where we are in terms of international trade rules. So uh, I don't need to get into uh, particular details on the importance of the digital economy in general, but for Mexico there's a clear recognition that the digital economy is uh, essential uh, for economic growth in the future for our country. And it's an area where we have a lot of opportunities. Uh, it is a key, uh, clear realization that uh, the development of uh, online businesses, the development of the internet, the services, and the ability to strengthen supply chains is one of the key elements that is attractive for us uh, in terms of strengthening our relationship within the NAFTA and uh, with other countries in the world. So that is one of the key elements. And in Mexico, since 2000, 2002, we launched a program called ProSoft in which we um, look to develop the IT sector. This has been a priority. And now under the uh, Peña Nieto administration, there's been the launching of a national digital strategy, which aims to promote, in, promote innovation, technology adoption, and IT sector strengthening. We still have a lot of challenges in Mexico. It's a growing sector, uh, IT, in which we have developed uh, large clusters across the country from Monterrey, our traditional industrial center, but new clusters in the, the central states, such as Querétaro and Jalisco, where we're trying to develop our own version of uh, Silicon Valley, and uh, of course around uh, Mexico City. Uh, and the challenges that we face is that although we have, for example, uh, over 40 million internet users, we still have a very low penetration rates of, our, of around 35 percent. Same applies for, uh, for a broadband uh, uh, penetration into Mexico. Uh, at the same time, we are an attractive center for the development of, uh, of software for design. Uh, increasingly, more and more companies are investing in Mexico and creating jobs and developing these supply chains uh, and, and, and in terms of our strategy to try to see Mexico as a hub for, uh, for exports to the rest of the world. So when it comes to the discussions in the, in the TPP, I cannot speak uh, on behalf of all of the other countries, but uh, we know that it is, uh, just as it is for Mexico, it is a key element of the negotiations. Uh, the, uh, the main principles that we follow in the discussions within uh, the TPP we're interested in promoting international principles that contribute to the development of the digital economy. And um, as this is reflected in our approach to international trade negotiations, we see TPP as a possibility, as I mentioned at the beginning, to upgrade the NAFTA, to really address issues that didn't exist when NAFTA was negotiating. And so some of the main topics that, are, that we're looking at and addressing is, uh, on the one hand, uh, prohibiting the uh, discrimination in digital products and, and looking to eliminate all types of duties uh, on content transmitted electronically. And this is very important when we look at uh, the trading goods and the reductions of tariffs that, that we've experienced over the years. We now see that the same has to apply on electronically transmitted uh, uh, goods. Uh, also, uh, the issue of uh, the localization, the location of computing uh, facilities and services. So looking at no requirements to set up service and computing facilities in the country where the service is to be provided. And this is very important in terms of liberalizing and, and, and uh, promoting the penetration of uh, e-commerce and the ability to develop uh, the, the IT sectors in the different members, countries that participate in the TPP. Addressing, of course, the issue of uh, cross-border data flows is very important in terms of uh, uh, how do we regulate and make sure that while we take into consideration concerns that are very important for all of our countries on uh, data privacy laws, that at the same time we promote an environment which allows for free cross-border data flows. And uh, while there are different opinions and legal regimes in each of the TPP countries, these are some of the key elements that are guiding uh, the discussions. For us, it's very important to, uh, to look at the issue of how 
Progress in the TPP can serve as a blueprint for, for the NAFTA upgrade that I was talking about, but also for some of the issues that Gary might uh, discuss as well, which is what is happening in the multilateral scene, what happens in the WTO, where most of the agreements, as, as uh, Congressman Paul has mentioned, were negotiated in the early 1990s, and it, they also do not reflect the realities of the modern economy. And so hopefully with an uh, optimistic view of how we can move the issue from the discussion in TPP, which is undoubtedly the most important plurilateral negotiation going on right now worldwide to the larger WTO multilateral arena. And uh, one of the elements that is uh, that are uh, very important that should be con uh, considered in terms of developing uh, this network of, uh, of countries in, in strengthening the digital economy is how can we establish rules and international standards on, on all of the different issues affecting the digital economy that are relevant for its development. For example, I mentioned some of the key issues having to do with uh, specific trade issues on customs, uh, duties, location of computing facilities, but there's issues related to uh, electronic signatures and authentication, online consumer protection, and of course the issue of uh, personal information protection. So these are some of the issues that are being addressed within the TPP. Uh, Mexico uh, sees this as the most important negotiation going on right now, and we believe that for our own development, the uh, development of the IT sector and the digital economy is a key element of our growth development plan for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. Gary? Uh, thanks very much. I, I want to thank Scott oh, for me. I want to thank Scott for me being here, not only for the obvious reason of inviting me, but a fascinating conversation I had with him, I think, four years ago when he was at Procter & Gamble and we were discussing the Internet. He pointed out that Procter & Gamble was an Internet company, and I said, please explain. And he explained to me the depth with, to which Procter & Gamble, a, what is viewed as a manufacturing company, in fact, was deep into online uh, relationships with its customers, with its suppliers, with its whole supply chain, uh, with dreaming up new products, with advertising. Um, and it's what the congressman said earlier. There's no divide anymore between digital companies and manu goods companies. They're all internet companies now, and so, which is part of the reason why there's so much, why this room is so full. Um, the um, And it's only going to get more so. The numbers are pretty clear. The projections, which are, I have no reason to doubt, are that 5 billion people, 5 billion people in the world will have broadband access by the end of this decade. Why? Mobile phones. Uh, almost everyone's internet access will be by phones. Um, but with smartphones, which are not that expensive anymore in, in developing countries, so this is not some pipe dream. You know, when we're back here in 2020, it'll be at least five billion. That's most of the world will be connected. Um, and they'll be using it for all the things that none of us will think of today. Because <laughs> if you go back five years, we're doing things no one thought of. Um, so uh, TPP, you heard both from the congressman and the two prior speakers exactly why this is such an attractive thing for TPP countries. It eliminates distance. The Pacific Ocean is a really big ocean. If you grow up in Australia or Chile or Singapore or Malaysia, you grow up thinking, I'm really far away from everything, and now you're not. So with no capital cost at all, as was pointed out, you can sit in your parents' garage or flat. They're paying for the broadband access. They're bringing you free food. You have free rent. And you can become a digital startup. And, it, and if you open the main Singapore newspaper on Sunday, every Sunday they list the new startups in Singapore, and they're all internet. Um, and, but it's not, I don't want to, again, go back to thinking it's just internet. There's a vineyard in New Zealand, I think, makes 300 cases a year. That's it. They're really good wines. They cost $100 a bottle. You cannot get Diageo to distribute your product if you only make 300 cases a year. You just, it was not a business, you could, it's not a sustainable business model. Uh, with, now with the internet, all 300 cases are sold in the US. Not, it's not just e-commerce in the sense of I can go online and order a case and FedEx or UPS will get it to me. It's 
I hear about it. You go online, if you're a wine connoisseur, and you hear about this, you would never have heard of because 300 cases couldn't support the advertising budget. I won't beat this to death. We all know it. This has totally changed the economics of everything. Um, if you're a TPP country other than the U.S., this is astonishingly attractive. You don't have to lose your entrepreneurs to the U.S. Remember, most, not most, a large chunk of Internet companies in the U.S. were founded by non-U.S. origin people. Half of Google, right? A Russian, eBay, French, Skype, a Swede, and on and on and on. Uh, Silicon Valley is a monument to wise to better immigration policy. Um, the um, so if you're a country in the TPP area, you're looking at something that suddenly you're not competing with this behemoth, the U.S., where you have to have huge amounts of capital to build a huge bricks and mortar factory, et cetera, et cetera. The economics we've been discussing are really attractive to smaller, distant countries that gives them opportunities they never had. So in a normal trade negotiation, I'm the U.S. trade negotiator. I'm going to these countries and saying, uh, lower your tariff on pork and my pork producers will wipe out your pork producers. That's not this negotiation for the Internet. This is, does anyone here want an Internet economy? Every TPP country says yes. And to finish it up, I don't want to overstay my time, but we'll get more to it in questions. This is a trade negotiation. I'm going to overstay my time a little bit. Um, the, the, um, so you're not wiping out. You're giving everyone an opportunity to do things they couldn't do before. And there are trade-offs. There's stuff in this agreement for everyone. So you might think a country like Vietnam might be a little nervous about the Internet. Probably is. But... If the U.S. does the right thing, Vietnam is going to have huge increase in exports of garments. I know that sounds 19th century, but you know we're talking about 19th century trade negotiations here. And the potential increase in exports of garments and footwear from Vietnam suddenly makes signing this agreement, which will have Internet stuff, attractive. So there are, that's one reason why TPP is a perfect venue for this. You couldn't just go negotiate an Internet agreement. Now, so where are we now? Very briefly. There is language in the telecoms annex, not just the telecoms agreement, but the annex, to, so the 1994 telecoms annex to GATS, which is very useful for the Internet. Um, I worked on a, the only case which has dealt even vaguely with the Internet dispute, which was the telecoms dispute, where that language proved very useful. There are reasons why the U.S. is wary of using it, but the language is there. Free trade agreements have some language. Korea is always held up as the exemplar. That was negotiated in 2007, and trust me, that's not the language you want in a current Internet agreement. So you don't just repeat that. So TPP is a great opportunity to get it right. You have the right mix of countries. You want to negotiate an agreement that includes developed and developing countries. Uh, it's a good test bed. So you have the right mix of countries. You have the right mix of trade-offs. You get it right here. You take it into TTIP, where Europe badly wants to catch up with the U.S. on the digital economy. Because the U.S. legal structure for the Internet has been favorable, we have a stronger Internet economy than Europe. And so the, the, the idea is to make, give those protections worldwide to Internet entrepreneurs. And then finally, or maybe in parallel, TISA, Trade and Services Agreement, which has a mix, and multilateralize it. So right now, I couldn't, you know, we, we don't want it done in ITU, to be blunt. We tried that. Um, we, you know, you're not going to do this FTA by FTA because then you have a patchwork of obligations. The Internet is not very good with patchworks. I mean, technically. Um, you know, and governments have a hard time catching up with this. So doing this, doing data protection country by country won't work. It just won't work. Um, Government, just I'll finish up with governments. So governments always lag reality. There's nothing wrong with that or surprising. No Internet company is on any ITAC. There are lots of reasons for that, but it tells you there's a lag. Um, and 
Um, there's nothing new about the internet. Uh, the internet, you know, universities were buzzing about this more than 50 years ago. I sent my first email when I was a college sophomore in 1965. So it was out there, but it didn't really hit Washington until really dial up and in the 1990s. And we've been catching up ever since. Um, everyone knows we have to, that we have to deal with it. Everyone knows we have to get it right, or we cut off our biggest single source of economic growth. And the same is true in TPP. So I'll leave it at that. Take questions. Thank you, Gary. Johanna. Sure. Um, first, thanks for uh, having us here. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of where we are and where we see the internet right now and where it, where it's headed. Uh, Gary touched on that a bit, and then um, some suggestions for uh, how the trade w uh, world can reflect some of the um, robust and um, vitality of the internet going forward. Um, there are 2.5 billion people connected to the internet today. Um, even and at that number, the internet, if it were a sector, the consumption and, and expenditures on the internet, if they were a sector, bigger than energy, bigger than ag, um, bigger than most of the traditional sectors that are that are out there in our economy, and that's today. Going forward, there are seven billion people on the planet, so there are about more than five billion that do have cell phones. As Gary mentioned, we expect all those cell phones to be upgraded to smartphones um, at some point in the next few years. So let's think about the growth potential for um, commerce and transactions occurring um, through those smartphones. We see it at Google. One in four of our videos um, now on YouTube are, are, are mobile devices that are watching them. We have 1.5 million activations of Android devices a day. Um, we've had 50 billion uh, apps downloaded from Google Play. Many of those apps developers, by the way, are probably sitting in the TPP countries um, that are being discussed here in those garages that, uh, that the congressman was talking about. At Google, more than half of our searches come in from outside the United States. Um, and the interesting thing from where I sit is 20% of those searches have a local intent of some kind. You're, they're trying to get to a restaurant or trying to get to something that is in your local community. So if you think about that, with more populations coming online in other countries around the world, how much the internet can uh, just augment the already existing commerce and commercial sphere for um, the countries that are involved in TPP. So we, are, um, we see a very uh, bright horizon um, coming down for the rest of the world in particular, um, in places that we do think there is um, a lag, as Gary had talked about, to, and we need to reorient trade towards this information economy and towards the drivers of the information economy, many of which are things like knowledge um, and access to human capital and where those developers are that have really smart ideas. Um, a, lot of, a lot of successful internet uh, ventures are just really basic ideas done in a simple, easy, um, understandable way for, for consumers. And so we think that could, is going to occur um, you know, anywhere in the world where, where you can, again, get internet access and, and reach that global marketplace. Um, in terms of our suggestions going forward, we, we really focus on three areas in trade. One is um, e-commerce priorities, again, to augment the, the, um, the commerce that is already occurring today. Second is um, a, a dig an intellectual property regime that, is, that is, enables the digital economy to, to grow and thrive. Um, and third is transparency. So I'm going to touch on those three pieces. Um, in terms of e you know, the e-commerce um, priorities, there has been some uh, recognition of, of the importance of having e-commerce as um, uh, a focus within trade agreement texts, um, but we think there is much, much, much more that needs to occur. Um, the, nearly every modern um, business relies on cross-border information flows. That's been discussed here by everyone, and you'll hear it um, more and more going forward. Uh, Governments that actively encourage and protect cross-border information flows will benefit from increased investment in economic growth in their countries. Um, we, that's a proven fact um, from Google and other pr companies' perspectives, and we just need to make sure that people understand that the, the way in which the global marketplace is occurring and the information economy is occurring, that is actually crucial to having the open um, atmosphere for investment in your own country. Um, McKinsey did a study that 75% of the Internet's benefits are actually captured by companies in traditional industries. 
So we think more and more traditional industries, like the Procter & Gamble's and like others, will realize that the, this baseline of cross-border information flows is essential to their ability to do commerce um, in the world today. We are uh, concerned about the localization barriers that have also been mentioned by others. Things like locating servers or data in particular countries, um, requiring local sourcing, requiring um, technology transfers. That's not the way the internet functions. <laughs> The internet is a very efficient, decentralized, distributed um, architecture, and when you try to put these digital protectionist barriers in, it really doesn't work. Um, so we, we hope to, that more people will uh, understand that those things will fundamentally cut off their own users from participating in a very vibrant um, community on the internet. Um, and so we're, we think that despite um, the various uh, tendencies that some companies, countries may have, um, that we're going to get to a point where people realize that they can't disrupt the actual technical architecture of the internet. It's very important to us that um, intermediaries are not held uh, liable legally for what users uh, do with the platforms. This is a very um, well understood concept in the United States legal framework um, and not as um, well understood around the world. So we, we need to work on that as well. Um, uh, privacy has been mentioned. You know, the uh, uh, companies like mine and um, many others, all, all of the U.S. companies doing um, business online, um, care a lot about privacy and have extensive procedures set up to ensure the privacy and security of our user data. We need a workable global system of mutual recognition there, and we think, again, that is a, just a, rea a function of the reality of the global marketplace that will, um, will be carried through as we go forward. In terms of intellectual property, uh, Google strongly believes that the U.S. government can do uh, more to export the full uh, United States legal framework around the world. Um, we could require trading partners to provide for fair use um, or other pro-innovation limitations and exceptions that, that are needed for the digital economy. So fair use, as you know, is, is a way for new technologies and new creativity to occur, provided that it's not displacing the marketability of the original copyrighted work. That's a very important principle for innovation and for new, um, you know, new ideas uh, like a, a search engine, like other kinds of um, uh, social networking and that kind of thing. It's a very important concept, again, in the United States legal framework that uh, we hope gets exported more around the world. Um, we also, it's um, important for us that there's uh, meaningful safe harbors, um, and through things like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, we do see the United States government um, trying to make sure that those safe harbors, so that there's you know uh, a, a workable framework where there is an, um, infringement in the intellectual property space, it can come down in a very efficient way. And so that's been something that has worked very well for both the content side and the technology side, and we think it will again be exported around the world. You know, we uh, as it, it, just sort of pausing on where we are in terms of intellectual property right now, you know, 50% of the music industry's revenues are now coming in digitally, which not many people realize, I don't think. 40% of the video game uh, revenue is coming in digitally. 30% of video um, and broadcasting is coming in digitally. And 20% of books are coming digitally. So we are, re you know, in terms of the project projections and the trajectory, we really need to really focus on the intellectual property regime for the digital world, because that is where the revenue growth will occur, even for the creative industries as well. Third, on transparency. Um, we're an internet company. We, 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 um, have, we have a very much of a, an internet policy approach to things, which is an open, collaborative environment to work things out in a consensus way. We, you know, from the multi-stakeholder forums that, that uh, have resolved through, since the, in the history of the internet from the 60s, that have resolved technical or other disputes, that is the way in which we, as, um, as, an, as a sector, understand how you work things out and resolve them. It's very open, it's very collaborative. We don't necessarily see the transparency in the trade space um, in a way that we're used to, and so that's something that we're working through. Um, and we think that the U.S. can lead in this and take more steps to um, have trade discussions more transparent um, for stakeholders, for other governments, um, and for users of the internet, which is an important piece here that I, that we can't um, we can't forget about in these discussions. So. Um, 
you guys are more experts on that, and I look forward to how we can all work together on some of those priorities. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, before I open the floor to questions, are there any questions that panelists have for each other? Okay, we'll go to the audience. Once again, the same three rules apply. Uh, wait for the microphone, introduce yourself, and identify your organization, and ask a question. Don't make a statement. Thank you. There's a question in the back. Thank you. Hi, I'm Matt Schul from Inside U.S. Trade. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask a question, probably most directed to Ken and Gary. Um, you know, you and the other panelists seem very, uh, you know, keen on on saying why all this digital economy stuff is so important, and we have to include it in the TPP, and it benefits everybody. Although Gary, you also acknowledge that you know some other TPP countries might not see it that way. So I guess the question I want to ask is, why? Um, why then has it become so controversial and, and such a difficult issue? I, I was talking about the Vietnam statement that you made. They'll benefit, well, right, okay. But they'll, they'll, they may be a little uh, cautious and they may also seek benefits in other areas. But so why has it become so difficult, uh, especially with Australia and New Zealand, uh, you know, basically, uh, Australia tabling a counter proposal and all of their concerns about this proposal on free data flows especially center around privacy which all of you kind of mentioned generally but I was just hoping that you could maybe go into more detail and explain uh, you know why then is it so controversial and why this privacy thing has become such a big deal and also Ken if you could explain where Mexico comes down on that debate does it support a U.S. approach that's more um, data flow should be open uh, except for, you know, very uh, limited exceptions that have to do with privacy, or does it support an Australian pr approach that's more, um, you know, countries should have the right to put in place barriers uh, to data flows as long as certain, uh, you know, conditions are met? Thank you. Thanks a lot, Matt. I wouldn't want to speak on behalf of other countries uh, that are negotiating the TPP or provide any details on anything that's going on in the actual negotiations for obvious reasons. These is, negotiations are ongoing. Uh, what I can say uh, to, to your overall question is that uh, rather than, than, than saying which position we adopt, we, we obviously are pursuing uh, and, and, and adhere to the Mexican position, which is to look for opportunities of strengthening the disciplines that, uh, that exist in the international trade regime. Uh, we pointed in, in, the previous, uh, in my previous intervention, we talked about some of the key principles that we pursue. We think that um, many countries, including Mexico, uh, can benefit enormously from clear rules which uh, guarantee some of these key principles in terms of uh, eliminating any barriers that exist on electronically uh, traded uh, goods and services. This is something that we pursue actively. We pursue actively within that context of, uh, of the TPP, and it is something that we believe will bring great benefits uh, to Mexico. There is a uh, the recognition, of course, that there are aspects that are delicate in any negotiation. The issue of uh, data privacy is very important. Mexico has uh, approved a set of, um, of legal uh, uh, instruments to strengthen uh, data privacy standards. We have uh, approved key uh, cyber protection, cyber security laws that aim precisely at ensuring the protection of personal information within the Mexican environment. We obviously want to ref uh, have strong uh, disciplines reflected in our, in our international trade agreements. Let me start sort of big picture and get granular really fast. As uh, Scott pointed out, the Internet's very disruptive, which is a good thing in economic terms, by the way. We're much better off with the disruptions of the 200 years than living as subsistence farmers before then, um, burying our children, etc. cetera. So uh, basically the world trading system is a good thing and people don't say that enough, so I just did. Um, so, um, but that means when, when the internet appears, there are existing things already there and each country has existing laws. Fortunately for the U.S., the U.S. had existing laws 
this is, we're Americans, this wasn't planned. <laughs> you know, it was an accident. Um, we had fair use. Why did we have fair use? Well, you know, Chancellor Kent probably wasn't thinking of the internet when he started thinking about this on, to almost 200 years ago. And we have no, we have protection from intermediary liability. Why? You all are in Washington, because when Congress got interested in this, how did you get the internet? Dial up. Screech, remember? You were dialing up a phone company, and believe me, phone companies had really good lobbyists um, in 1998. It wasn't because Google was out lobbying, they just dropped out of Stanford. Um, but, and and AT&T also had enough technological savvy to know it wouldn't always be copper wires. So they wrote the, the little bits in the, you know, 1998 law to make sure there was no secondary liability for them. They weren't doing it to create an internet. They just wanted to make sure no one sued them. So, and thank you. So that's why the U.S. is such an advanced internet economy. We also have a lot of garages. Um, <laughs> but, but other countries don't have that legal structure. Not because they chose not to. This is all random. No one was thinking about any of this. So the internet appears, and as Johanna said, this is not an inter there's not an American internet and a Mexican internet. And technologically, it wouldn't work, and you wouldn't get the benefits. So countries really want the benefits, and that's why I want to be clear. Vietnam included, they all want the benefits of the internet. If you ask them if they want to cut themselves off from the internet, there was a study of what happened when the internet was cut off in Egypt mm -hmm. two years ago, it was huge losses. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you know, so you don't think of Egypt as a really advanced economy? It is, believe me, it's dependent on the internet. Um, so um, when you get really down into the negotiations, yes, every country has existing laws. All countries' negotiators automatically say, I'm not gonna change my law. That's why you have a negotiation. So we haven't seen the end of TPP. And if you go down Johanna's list, a lot of the things she listed, Australia and or New Zealand, have been very helpful, maybe even more helpful, dare I say it, than some parts of the U.S. government. Um, because there are existing business models here that are disrupted by the Internet. So um, this is what happens in a trade negotiation. There's no surprise. The, and that's why, as I said at the beginning, there's enough trade-offs in TPP that if the U.S. government really wants to take advantage of something where we're reaping enormous benefits, we're in a position in this negotiation to get a really good outcome that's not only good for the U.S., but for all the other countries. Thank you. Just a, just an addition. Another way to think about this is, you know, the, the reason there's controversy is not because of the, is partly because of the disruption the internet creates, but but this this entering context is very different among the partners. Now that's the that's the opportunity in TPP. Okay, but think about think about just one step away from the digital economy. Think about press freedom in the twelve countries represented at the negotiating table of the of the TPP. You have you know open societies. Like the United States, you know, strong, strong historical protections on freedom of the press. At the other extreme, you have authoritarian states like Vietnam. In the middle, you have, I mean, Singapore is one of the one of the most, if not the most, open economy in the world, but maintains because of that's that's its history and culture maintains restrictions on the press. Okay, and you have everything in between. Okay, it's not surprising that you'd find that same legal context manifesting itself in an area that's as disruptive as the internet. So, uh, next question, please. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Thank you to the panel for an interesting discussion. My name is Shannon Gaffney, and I'm with the U.S. International Trade Commission. And my question actually goes back to what the congressman reminded us. It seems that on the panel, and all of us in this room have an urgency in getting this right on digital economy for TPP, that we need it now, we need it in the future for the TTIP and other future agreements. Um, and it has implications not just for digital companies, but for those like Procter & Gamble that we don't necessarily think of in that way. But he also reminded us that many members of Congress don't have this on their agenda, that they're not thinking about it, that it's not a priority for them, especially those that are not on the Ways and Means Committee. So my question is, 
um, is there anything that we in this room should be doing or could be doing in order to raise the profile of TPP and other such trade agreements going forward for Congress? I mean, you know, Congress doesn't pay attention to anything until they have to, and so I, I think, you know, where we have focused and, and what we try to do is uh, is make sure that we get the agreement right, and then we go back to Congress and say, here's a really good agreement that um, you have to pay attention to now. Um, I will say, you know, just having some informal conversations up on the Hill, um, there's a surprising amount of attention I, under the radar by, by staff, including by chiefs of staff uh, in offices, uh, paid to trade issues generally, and, you know, I was surprised. Uh, to hear uh, from some of our colleagues on the Hill about how their members have run on a positive trade agenda recently, um, in, in recent elections, in ways that they might not have in the past. And so, you know, you, we had some conversations around the time that the sequestration went into effect, and you start seeing representatives of districts, even, you know, sort of around D.C., uh, which have been re reliant heavily on government contracts to start thinking about, well, we need uh, alternate sources of a business of revenue, and so they start looking to uh, international markets. Um, I, I think um, I, I think there is a lot of interest on the Hill, but it's not going to manifest itself until uh, you know they have something concrete to look at. Just to add, I mean, this is no different than any other trade agreement. If you look at the data of the last 15 U.S. big trade agreements, 12 of them passed by like 300 votes. Why? Because there were lots of gains for U.S. economic interests. And so uh, I'm counsel for the U.S. cattle ranchers. If Japan is open on beef, uh, TPP is, will be the largest U.S. FT, by FTA ever. If Japan opens on beef, believe me, it's worth it to us. And so there are 725,000 cow-calf operations in America in every state. Yes, our senators would hear from us. And there's no need to do that yet, but when it happens, it happens. That's why they pass by 300 votes. Let me be microscopic. Someone raised dairy. The U.S. dairy industry, which I don't work for, but I observe, the U.S. dairy industry is very technologically advanced. We have a lot of water here. We have a lot of land. If you drive around, you see a lot of very happy cows, right? <laughs> okay, we are one of the world's biggest dairy exporters, and we will become the world's biggest dairy exporter. So the U.S. dairy industry is in favor of TPP. Obviously, they have concerns if it were, and think about it, if it were just a U.S.-New Zealand FTA and eliminated all barriers, the U.S. dairy industry would get access to a market saturated with dairy of 4 million people, and New Zealand would get access to a market of 310 million people. So the U.S. dairy industry is going to have concerns. That's why TPP works. So the U.S. dairy industry is looking at access to Japan, which is they haven't had much access to, to Canada, and all of a sudden you start seeing it. So Australia and New Zealand see, hey, we can get access to the U.S. and Japan and Canada. Some Canadians want access to the U.S. market, which they haven't had, et cetera, et cetera. And suddenly a deal that would be impossible bilaterally becomes not only possible, but eagerly sought. And that's, if those deals occur, we haven't seen the final product, this thing passes by hundreds of votes without, you know, there'll be, every, there's always complaining, people come to Washington, I was born here, people come to Washington to complain, it's depressing. Um, it's, it's a First Amendment right. It is. But to petition the Congress for redress of grievances. Not grievances. to say they're doing a good job. Grievances, <laughs> think about it. Come and whine. I, I spent most of my career as a partner in a Los Angeles-based law firm, and going out there was great, because you could have 10% unemployment, but if the sun was shining, hey, let's go surfing. <laughs> you know, not here. No matter how good things are, someone's whining. Yeah. Is there but, a question in the but, back? I'm sorry. Hi. Oh, was there some? Well, uh, Doug Palmer with Reuters. Um, just picking up on a point that the congressman made, um, and later today across town there's another discussion uh, called Impact of Prism on Digital Trade. I just wondered, uh, have, have those revelations made the TPP discussions more difficult? Um, is there more resistance uh, to, to U.S. ideas? and proposals as a result of that revelation? Uh, from Google's standpoint, we're, we're obviously um, 
very focused on the transparency as it relates to us um, and have uh, uh, have taken steps to with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to be able in a, to be in a position where we can um, talk uh, and reveal publicly in our transparency report the um, the number of requests we get uh, and the amount of uh, accounts affected by that. And we are awaiting the government's response. So I think we are um, very focused on that piece right now um, and uh, and are, are hopeful that we'll be able to be more transparent about it. I'm speaking on that panel later on today. And so um, you can go. Preview the conference. Yeah, I guess I'll give you a preview. But um, I think. I think it's, um, it will have a short-term effect generally uh, in that it, it makes um, negotiators more, deliver, more deliberate about how um, they raise these issues um, with other countries. Uh, and I think it, it necessitates um, a more robust conversation about the impact of, of privacy and national security on, on digital trade. Um, I, I think that was going to happen anyway, um, but, but this sort of clarifies the issue for negotiators. Um, I think the major point here is that what's the alternative? And, and I, I don't think this is going to have a, a long-term impact or derail um, sort of improving the global framework for um, the digital economy. I mean, it can't. You know, what, what are we going to do? We're going to not trade data across borders with each other uh, and handicap the greatest engine of growth that we've seen in, um, ever. Um, so I, I, think, um, I, I think it will sort itself out, but it, it will take some time to do that. Gentleman in the standing at the back. Good morning. I'm George Lyle from Internews, and a, a legal question: uh, Is there still a distinction between internet companies and telecom companies? And if there is, at what point does the regular company, like Mr. Horlick was saying, become an internet company and thus a telecommunications company? The word telecommunications has different legal meanings in different documents. And that's actually a very important point I'm not going to bother you with here. So the question of who has regulatory authority is, as you obviously know, very important. Um, but use of the Internet, um, you know, Procter & Gamble is an Internet company. Uh, it may not be in the business of offering telecommunications services, but it's definitely an internet company, um, and so is everyone. But that's very different legally than whether you are a regulated telecommunications company. Hi, um, my name is Robin's Pan. My name is Robin's Pancake. I'm uh, currently at the International Trade Commission. Uh, this question is mainly for Joanna um, uh, and relates to SMEs. Um, I presume Google's a pretty big company now. Um, I presume that you have a lot of, uh, uh, you do a lot of business with SMEs, uh, mainly here but also around the world. Um, Gary mentioned the, um, the uh, winery in New Zealand. That sounds like an SME to me, um, and, um, and most of them are probably. But in the high-tech space, um, do you think the TPP negotiations on digital trade um, uh, do a sufficient job of uh, enabling SMEs? Or, uh, and I don't happen to know whether there's a separate chapter on SMEs in the TPP, but to what extent in order to uh, motivate and incentivize uh, the SMEs, do we need to focus on them especially? Or is it just one of these uh, let many flowers bloom if we put the right you know, landscape out there? That's a um, very perceptive question. Uh, in our view, if you get the overall foundations right for the digital economy, for the information to flow, for that, it will have tremendous um, benefits for the, the SME environment, for the small and medium-sized businesses. We really see a Google. Um, we're, we're in this, we are in the sort of rise of micro-multinationals, right? The, this notion that, comp that a person can be sitting anywhere in the world and design 
develop, deliver at a fraction of the cost a good or a product or a service or an idea to somebody else some, you know, somewhere else in the world. As an advertising platform, we see that every day in every country um, you know, around, around the world. We, uh, we have programs that are designed specifically to get more um, small and medium-sized businesses online and to be participating more in this global um, marketplace. We have a program down in Mexico, we're working with the government down there, where we've um, done research on our end that shows that only 8% of um, Mexican small and medium-sized businesses have a website or have a web presence. So that's obviously a, a much lower number than we would want, and I <laughs> assume that Kenneth would want to. So we've been working with the um, government down there on, a, on a really uh, training sessions and, and, whole, and getting um, companies. We've In the past year, we've got 50,000 more small and medium-sized businesses in Mexico that have gone online, which is a, you know, a win-win for, for them, for the economy, for, um, for more participation in the online space. So again, the, the numbers are such, and you know, with more um, uh, internet access around the world, which is also a piece that Google um, takes very seriously and is looking on doing uh, more ways in which we can help bring affordable um, internet access to some of the most remote regions in the world, including in the TPP partners like the Balloon Project we just launched with New Zealand. Um, so <laughs> we, you know, not all of these will be successful. Um, but we really recognize that that is a piece of, uh, um, of the puzzle as well. So we, it's, it's, a, it's a really important question you raise. It, it is undisputed that um, uh, small and medium-sized businesses that are online have twice as much exports um, as, uh, as, any, as the non-online ones. So again, it's a win-win. If I may add something, precisely for the reasons that Joanna mentioned, is the fact that in the, within the Mexico's national digital strategy launched under this administration, there's a strong emphasis on SMEs. One has to understand that over 90% of the businesses in Mexico are micro or small enterprises. So that is really uh, the strongest, the nucleus of our economic activity. So across different government programs, there's an emphasis on, on strengthening them. In fact, we created a National Institute for Entrepreneurship that specializes on creating opportunities, access to capital, human capital development, et cetera, for SMEs. And within the National Digital Strategy, many institutes in Mexico, such as the Mexican Institute for Competitiveness, have estimated, for example, in terms of the availability of a uh, cloud technology, for example, uh, could reduce fixed costs between 1% and 5% for SMEs. And if you look at it in, over time with programs such as the one Joanna mentioned, working with Google and other uh, major companies in developing opportunities uh, on the internet for SMEs, there could be uh, an increase in Mexican jobs of up to 300,000. And these are conservative estimates of how much you could incorporate SMEs into economic activity through the internet. Because uh, there's a bit of a myth out there, we have to deal with it in Mexico, that when you talk about the digital economy, the web, uh, you're talking about a, a developed country issue, that you need to have certain basic uh, skill sets or investments or ability uh, to transfer data in ways that are not available to small and, and medium-sized enterprises. And this could be nothing further from the truth. When you see the opportunities that can be created for small enterprises and the opportunities of how uh, internet access itself leads directly to large increases in GDP growth in countries, and for a country of 90 percent uh, uh, of SMEs, well, you see the connection there naturally. And that's how we are uh, approaching the issue in Mexico. I, Just I would note, add. sorry, um, I saw a presentation by eBay that 99 percent of their SME business users export, which is astonishingly more than the average. I think the average U.S. you know business exports like one percent of them export, mostly the large ones. And anyone who's worked on this in government knows how much effort goes into relatively few results. And then an electronic net, an internet net platform, suddenly everyone does. But by the way, in the U.S., only 58 percent of small businesses have a web presence too. So we have more work we need to do here too. Even though three of us up here represent large companies, we're all very excited about small companies. So let me add to the mix. Um, Future members. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> Growth potential. I, you know, I think the best way to support small businesses through the TPP is to enable, um, a, a guarantee a cluster of services. So you need cloud services, financial services, shipping services. You need Facebook eBay, PayPal, DHL, and Salesforce all to be able to operate seamlessly across the platform because all of those things help small businesses export. And I, I mean, I think the exciting thing about it is that it, it helps change the narrative about trade in other countries. 
you've generally seen trade as um, perceived as, as a big threat and small opportunity for small businesses. And you know, as the congressman and others up here have suggested, uh, it, it, that's different now. And just maybe one example that's not exactly relevant to the TPP, we've been, I've had an opportunity to go and talk with a couple of uh, startups from emerging markets. And one of them was a gentleman named Obina Kizi, who started Wakanao.com, which is Nigeria's version of Travelocity. And so he was on um, CNBC a couple of years ago, and a venture capitalist from New York saw him. And so uh, you think about Nigeria, and, and you have sort of certain qualms about sending money over to Nigeria, given all the spam that you receive. But so he, he went to the internet and checked out his profile on LinkedIn and got uh, introduced to him through uh, uh, sort of other folks on LinkedIn. Uh, and you know that was in part what gave him the confidence to contact this guy and invest in his company. And you know that's that is, is a new is a relatively recent thing. So. Yeah, it's it's interesting. The the what there are several disruptive technologies that are helping SMEs. It's the web. It's social media. It's the the platforms like eBay. It's the existence of pa of small package delivery firms that are global. That didn't happen 20 years ago. And payments. Is and payment systems and the financial the financial infrastructure that supports it. So all those are key components. It's certainly in the trade facilitation chapter, but the financial services chapter as well of uh, TPP uh, will all support this SME development, which is going on right, is sort of out of out of sight, but but going on daily. So one final question, uh, this side of the room, yes, sir. Hi, I'm Scott Thompson from Samsung. Uh, thanks for everything today. Uh, you've talked a lot about the challenges and opportunities of TPP, and our companies started to weigh that. And in general, <clears throat> for a lot of the reasons you've talked about, thinks that on balance this is going to work out. And uh, that's colloquializing, but in general, that's where we end up, and that's going to mean on the margins at least we sell more smartphones and TVs and everything else that we do. Um, but as the trade guy, among other things, part of my job is to say, well, yes, but we want to make sure it works out. And so I am curious for your take of one or two items, chapters within the negotiations that at least have the potential to derail or sidetrack the talks in a way that would be uh, harmful to the information technology industry that we're talking about here today. Or put another way, where should a multinational company concentrate its efforts to make sure that we get across the finish line uh, in a couple of different parts of the, of the talks? Thank you. I think one area that it, it's essential to get right is intellectual property rights protection. And so uh, there are two dual challenges there. And the first is that effective protection and enforcement mechanisms are critical to innovators and, and to the success of certainly of, of American innovation. And I think it's important to acknowledge new challenges to IP protection in the digital age. And that's why you, you see negotiators talking about things like trade secret protection. Um, at the same time, I think it's also, as, as has already been mentioned, uh, important to construct a framework in a way that permits the digital economy to function. And so I think getting that right is, uh, there's a lot of attention on that already, but um, uh, including a, a, from a number of our member companies. And so I think that will be essential. I, I would echo that. I think really paying attention to is the intellectual property framework, um, modern um, and for the digital environment. Uh, I will point out, um, as it relates to Korea, that the most, uh, you know, that. Um, Things like YouTube, the most watched YouTube video of all time, as you guys may know, is Gangnam Style. Um, and that uh, resulted in $8 million of ad in advertising deals. So I think there, you know, the, the benefit that can flow to, uh, put to places like your country is tremendous if we get the balance on IP intellectual property protection right. For a company like Samsung, um, free advice, worth what you pay for it. But uh, in the negotiation itself, um, those are important. I would focus on the doing business ones, particularly trade facilitation or supply chain. That's going to have the biggest dollar impact you're going to get. You're going to get the tariff reductions anyhow. You have to worry about the phase outs, but you'll get them. Uh, it's the beauty of FTA. So it's making sure that your supply chains work. And that's one where there's less attention. Um, the, and make sure you're not hit by the whatever bizarre stuff is done for unstate-owned enterprises, because it's going to be a patchwork. With that, <clears throat> let me thank you all for attending today. And please join me in thanking our panel.